I'm worried in the short term that um, potential users of, of this technology are going to get ahead of their skis and think, wow, it's this general purpose AI. I will just put it in my weapon system. And the truth is the systems are not that reliable. If they can hallucinate facts about somebody's biography, well, what are they going to do on the battlefield? Um, it's pretty disconcerting. Um, <clears throat> most of the people I've talked to in the military are, are reasonably realistic about the limits, but there's a lot of hype and you know we're kind of surrounded by the hype every day in the media. Hello and a warm welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live from both coasts via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're tackling a monster of a topic, chat GBT, something which will likely affect us all eventually, if it hasn't already, and for our three guest speakers, an AI tool that they're already having to navigate. In this discussion, we will consider both the obvious and less apparent repercussions of utilizing a tool that is yet to be regulated or even fully understood. Gary Marcus is a scientist and entrepreneur, author of Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. He's also Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience at NYU and hosts the podcast Humans versus Machines. Jane Rosenzweig is Director of the Harvard Writing Center a freelance writer and author of Writing Hacks newsletter. And completing the trio, Wesley Wildman is professor in the School of Theology and in the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences at Boston University. He's also executive director of the Center for Mind and Culture. Steering our discussion today will be Andrew Kimball, director of online lifelong learning at BU School of Theology. He will act as moderator. Well, such a big topic. Welcome to you all. And without wasting any further time, it's my pleasure to hand over the discussion to Andrew. Thank you, Mary, and good evening to everyone. We have an esteemed panel and major topics. So let's dive right in. Gary, to get us started, you and other tech industry leaders such as Elon Musk and Sam Altman signed a letter requesting or perhaps demanding a moratorium on training large AI systems more powerful than ChatGPT4 because they pose profound risks to society and humanity. What is ChatGPT and what risks are associated with this technology? We may be urged rather than demanded. I don't think we have the authority to demand. So ChatGPT is an AI system that is trained on a massive amount of human text. Um, you can also train it on things like programming languages. Um, but we'll stick today probably to the <clears throat> training on human text version. And it can say things like a human would say in many contexts. I would say that its comprehension of the world is limited, but that despite not having any real comprehension of the world, because it has so much text that it's trained on, it often says things that are plausible, sometimes says things that are useful. And I think it's you know, it's the fastest growing consumer technology of all time, um, or fastest inter growing internet technology. Um, <clears throat> people are finding all kinds of purposes. They're still exploring what it can do for them. So the programming version helps programmers. People are using it to write boilerplate text. Probably everybody in the audience has seen it. It's, it's so popular and got so popular so quick. Um, on the risk side, there are concerns about whether it might be used to generate misinformation, it or very similar tools. There's a more general category here we call large language models. ChatGPT is one instance of it. It has something called guardrails that make it somewhat safe, but not perfectly safe. Um, bad actors might use the general form of technology to create deliberate misinformation. Um, even with the guardrails, it creates a lot of accidental misinformation. Like there was a case that the Washington Post described a couple of weeks ago where it, the system said somebody was involved in sexual harassment when they weren't really. Um, one version of the system made up a fake reference to an article in the Washington Post that didn't exist. And then a later version referred to a op-ed that described what had happened and why it was bad that the system was making up misinformation that defamed people. Um, and then that system, Bing was the second system, referred to the op-ed that said X and basically cited it for not X. And so um, just made up kind of arbitrary stuff. So we have those kinds of problems. 
Um, there are problems, potential problems with medical misinformation, potential uh, uses that cybercrime or cyber criminals might use these things for. So <clears throat> there are both positive uses and negative uses. And because it's exploding so fast, nobody really knows either the sort of upper or lower, lower bounds of it. But it's the first time we've been really pressed with a lot of open-ended AI in the real world. And can you say more about the moratorium? Uh the moratorium specifically um, is often misconstrued. Um, what the moratorium, which I did not write, but I signed and helped popularize, what it called for was a ban on one particular thing, which was the training of models bigger than GPT-4, which is the biggest known model. Um, and so it said, we don't want anybody to train GPT-5, basically. Um, it did not call for a ban on AI research in general. And in fact, there's no other research uh, research system ever <clears throat> that it said you couldn't do, no other research topics. So it was a very narrow ban on one particular piece of research, um, GPT-5, and it didn't call for a ban on AI at all. So its opponents often try to portray it as a ban on AI, which it was not, or a ban on AI research, which it was not. It was actually promoting more AI research on making AI safe and trustworthy and so forth. So it was really misportrayed, but it was saying, let's not build GPT-5. We know GPT-4 is reckless. GPT-5 is going to be reckless in some of the same ways. Let's hold on. It would be an even better tool for making misinformation, for example. Does the world really need that? Maybe we should wait. I also personally proposed um, a moratorium on deployment rather than research, um, which would be another way of sort of slowing down and holding up. And then more broadly, I've been proposing that we need an international agency for AI governance. And maybe we'll talk about that later. Thank you so much. Uh, Jane and Wesley, over to you. As academics who work in different disciplines, mm -hmm. does using the current version of ChatGPT undermine or augment the learning goals in your respective classrooms? Jane, let's begin with you. Okay, um, well, very directly, I teach writing and I teach writing to college students. And so ChatGPT can write as uh, Gary was saying, and many of you have probably experimented with it. Uh, so I would say, I'm not gonna say undermine, but I will say it poses more challenges or causes more problems than it solves for what we're trying to do in the, in the writing classroom. Probably the best way I've found to explain this is that um, a, there's a distinction between a product and a writing process. So chat GPT can create a product, right? You can say, write me a short paper about this topic, or you can say, um, give me 10 ideas for my paper. You can ask it for output. But what we're trying to do in the college writing classroom, at least, is, is encourage a process of critical thinking. So we're saying to students, figure out what you think and use writing to do that. What questions do you have? What Let's look at how you look at evidence, how you analyze evidence, how you figure out what you think. And so chat GPT can kind of uh, short circuit that whole process and just give you an output, but it's not doing what we want our students to be able to do, which is think for themselves. So um, for for example, I mean, if you were to say to, to someone, you know, well, someone else thinks X um, and what do you think, right? That's a conversation. But if you say, ask chat GPT what it thinks, it's not yet clear exactly how that's useful in the process. Although there are many educators who are valiantly trying to figure that out. Yes, thanks. James, right, I think that this is a big challenge to students who are trying to figure out how to think and to teachers who are trying to help them learn how to think. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not necessarily a complete stop, though. We've got lots of ways of learning how to think as human beings. Not all of them involve writing. Humanities scholars like me as a philosopher, as an ethicist, uh, we do routinely use writing as a way to evaluate whether people understand what they're supposed to be learning. And we deeply value the process that Jane has just described. That's completely correct. My students uh, in the ethics of technology class that I'm teaching at the moment, they really want help to figure out how to use this. They don't want their skill set damaged. They don't want people to cheat, which puts them at a disadvantage because they're competing for jobs in the tech world. 
And they, so they want us to flex. They want professors to rethink how they're trying to teach them. I think that's a really interesting challenge, and I've been <clears throat> moved by that. They're going to be living with these tools forever. So we need to appreciate the limitations of these tools, make sure that we stay focused on helping students how to think, but at the same time recognise that <clears throat> a lot of text generation in the future is going to be done differently than it is now, especially boilerplate type text that lawyers and insurance agents and uh, a lot of things, sermons as well in religious contexts. All of these things are, <clears throat> are going to be easier to generate, faster to generate. They will undermine the process of thinking, but at the same time, they'll free people up to do other things that they might value more. I think this is inevitable. So even if there's aspects of it I really don't like, I don't think it can be stopped either. So I think we need to be imaginative and flex. And I'll just uh, leave one thought about how to do that. The big challenge both in coding and in writing is going to be eliciting from generative AIs. The skill involved in eliciting code from generative AIs is already something that we're trying to learn because the code's pretty good that it can generate. The same thing's true for writing as well. Eliciting is something like a higher order skill that needs to be mastered by professors and taught to students so that they can choose when to generate writing themselves and when to elicit using large language models and other forms of generative AI to create writing for them. Leslie, can you say a little bit more about the standards that you're working on here at Boston University with faculty and students? Uh, what are those standards and what do they hope to achieve? The Faculty for Computing and Data Sciences at Boston University uh, worked hard to develop a policy that responded to the sorts of student requests that I just listed before. So it's a positive but critical and measured embrace of generative AI. It requires students to be transparent about how they're using it to include an appendix where they document how they use it, to make sure that uh, generative AI text detection processes uh, are employed and that their text passes those so that they don't get caught by accident as having used generative AI when they shouldn't have. So all of those things are designed to get them to think critically about generative AI, for example, uh, Gen AI text generation uh, routinely hallucinates, creates mistakes, just as Gary was describing before. If a student is able to identify a mistake or improve on a superficial argument or criticise a point made in text that was generated by an AI, then it's understood that that student can gain the basic grading baseline that someone who did not use Gen AI uh, can gain. So those, uh, the, then after that, it's the excellence of the quality, excellence of the product. So this is a form of thinking, but it's not the same form as, of thinking as you use when you generate writing. It's a form of thinking related to critically engaging writing that's been produced and elicited by you, uh, elicited by you and produced from uh, a large language model of one kind or another. So that type of critical thinking is also extremely important and the kind of skill that they're going to need more and more in the years to come. Gary, so why exactly was ChatGPT created? Was it created to make human life simpler, to free us up to do more things, or was it created to help us solve real world human problems like climate change, hunger, and perhaps poverty? I guess in a way you have to ask OpenAI that question since they created it. Um, I will say, kind of taking that in a couple parts, I don't think it's actually a good tool for working on world hunger or global climate change and so forth. I, I think what it's at its best at is writing boiler, boiler <laughs> writing boilerplate text, um, which you know is very useful for an undergraduate writing a term paper. We can debate the morality of it, but certainly it can do that. Um, for the undergraduate. Um, it's not really good at scientific discovery. Um, to give people perspective, I like to talk about GPT-4 and playing chess. It's trained on a lot of chess games. It's trained on the rules of chess, but it can't actually follow those rules. So 
<laughs> it's tempting to see it as a general intelligence, but it only plays chess about as well as a chess computer from 1979 would play. Um, nowhere near as well as a good chess computer would now. It's not as if we can apply this technology to any problem in the world. Its strength is in generating plausible sounding text. It's not in reasoning about the world. It's not in interpreting the world. It's not really in inventing new things. <clears throat> you, know, you typically find that the writing that it does is fairly bland. It's not necessarily going to write something inspiring. It's pretty good at, at sort of doggerel style poetry, but um, it's probably not going to write a genuinely interesting poem either. Um, so, you know, it has its use cases. I think OpenAI was just kind of playing around with how can we generate something that has the general qualities of text? They did not expect that it was going to take off in the way that it did. Um, they were hoping it would be popular. They did some things to make it popular, which does not include naming it. Chat GPT is impossible to say. Many people you know, wind up with chat, and well, I won't give you alternatives, but we all know. Um, so it wasn't particularly well named, but what they did do to make it seductive is to make it type things out one word at a time, which made it have this sort of human quality. And part of why it's attracted people is it feels human. It isn't really, we shouldn't actually anthropomorphize it. And I think we make a mistake if we do. Um, one person actually committed suicide in response to a similar kind of <coughs> AI system, um, perhaps attributing more agency to it than it had and more wisdom than it had. So it's not a general purpose tool for all of AI. It's sort of like a jack of all trades and master of none. And in a domain where you don't need perfection, like maybe a term paper where your professor is grading 35 of them, maybe you don't need perfection. Um, but in domain like giving people medical advice, you would actually want that. Um, so from a perspective of an AI researcher, I would say it's a very intermediate step. Um, it's actually a fairly immature technology, but it does have some uses already, more than I think they were anticipating, and some risks as well that were not originally anticipated. And so you've got this thing that really should still be in the laboratory, in my view. Like people should be like, how do we make this better? How do we make it so we can trust it? But it's out there now. And so now we have to deal with that for better and for worse. The fact that uh that uh, these large language models can now pass a whole bunch of exams is quite interesting. I think one of OpenAI's motivations was the investment from Microsoft, $100 million, uh, which was a critical move in trying to produce Microsoft's Copilot, which is supposed to be uh, an efficiency increasing extension to the Microsoft Office suite which is uh, supposed to know a lot about you and your schedule and able to generate emails and text for you and so on. Microsoft's imagining that this is uh, transformative technology for massively increasing the efficiency of office workers. And they might be right or wrong about that. I suspect they're right. And I think OpenAI is heavily invested in releasing this and building up excitement specifically in order to advance this type of technology. $100 million is a large investment. And uh, yeah, Sorry, so, I think it's ten, the correct figure is ten billion dollars in the most recent round. So sorry, you're right. <clears throat> sorry, hundred million is uh, is Microsoft jump change compared to what what they uh, actually invest in. The, the hundred million is Microsoft's investment in the digital immortality technology. My mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Jane, please I go. was just going to jump in for a second to say that I think from the education perspective, Andrew's question, you know, why was this, uh, why was this developed is something that we're really grappling with, right? This is a, a, in a sense, a solution in search of a problem as far as education is concerned. And I think it's really important for us to think about that, not just at the college level where, you know, Wesley students have a certain facility with, with critical thinking already as they're helping develop these policies, but this technology is going to trickle down to K through 12, and we're going to have uh, chat GPT natives who may not learn to do the critical thinking that we're all doing. And I think that um, there's a huge pressure, um, part of it coming from ed tech and part of it just because this is out there that's sort of saying, you know, you this train is leaving, you need to get on this train, this is the future. And yet this is not something that was developed to solve the very real problems in K through 12 education and in college education. And so teachers are really grappling with something, um, which is uh, Gary actually nodded to this in an early newsletter the Jurassic Park moment um, from when Jeff Goldblum and Jurassic Park is yelling at the people who created the dinosaurs. You know, you didn't have, you, you weren't thinking about what 
what was going to happen when you did this. And I think from the education perspective, there's some exciting things, but there's also just this, this sense of, you know, upending, uh, disrupting everything. It is a dual use monster, right? Like there are positive uses and negative uses, none of which has been fully thought through. If I could just amplify one thing that's already come up twice is the critical thinking skills. A, a lot from the educational perspective, there's a possible win here, which is if students start to look at its output critically and use this as an opportunity to think critically, then it might be great. If they just rely on it, don't look critically, then it could be a disaster. And so a lot really is going to depend on what we do with it now that it's here. Are there any examples of sort of creative, critical usage of GPT that you would affirm? I mean, I can, I'm not a professor anymore. I was for decades, but um, what I would do if I were a professor now, it would be to say, <clears throat> go ahead, use chat GPT. And then your assignment's going to be to tell me what it got right, what it got wrong. You know, that's going to be a critical thinking assignment, um, how it could be better. Like I like to, when I was teaching writing, I like to teach my students, I would say, let's go look at Google News for something that was just reported. And we'll find 20 different stories on it with 20 different angles. So look at the angle that ChatGPT takes, it's almost always kind of straightforward, but dull. And tell me how you could write this from a different angle, like, you know, write it from Jay Gatsby's angle or, or Daisy Buchanan's angle or what, you know, do, do, do something else. Describe it if you were the street lighting, you watched the whole thing. Um, you know, compare it to what ChatGPT did. Why would this be better? Why would this be worse? What would this give you insight into? And so I would try to use it as a departure point and say, start with this and tell me where else you could go. Mm -hmm. Jane, I'm still ruminating on your recent comment. Uh, is it correct to say that you feel AI or really ChatGPT threatens RNA desire to think critically, problem solve, and innovate? I, I, I don't know if it's ChatGPT that threatens that or the ease of, of using ChatGPT, if there is such a distinction. I mean, my concern is, is not that individual students are using this in the classroom, right? That's that's a, a different set of circumstances. We can, we can deal with that in many ways, the way we've always dealt with what, what we would call cheating, you know, using it when you're not supposed to. My, my, that's not my main concern. My concern is that this idea that we all have to get on this train. And so if we do, if individual teachers do, if institutions do, if this is the way everything's done, I do think there are going to be things that are lost. Uh, maybe there are going to be things that are gained. But I just if I take Gary's example, there's nothing wrong with that. That sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do in a classroom. But what I do in my classroom right now is the same thing only with human texts, right? My students critique each other's arguments and talk about what 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 they missed or how you could look at that from a different angle and we we have guest speakers come in and we talk to them about their ideas and i just worry that some of that is going to be lost in this sort of ease and convenience of this machine that as as we've talked about really isn't saying anything particularly interesting right now and so is there going to be a flattening not only of of the ideas that we come up with but also of of genuine interest and engagement i mean you know people have different reactions to this i'm i did a lot with chat GPT to figure out what it was what was going on when it first came out. I now find it kind of depressing to interact with it. I can sort of predict what I'm going to get. And I don't know if this is going to be the thing that energizes a new generation of students to care about learning, or if it's just going to be what I fear it's going to be, which is a shortcut. We right. have a ton of different ways of teaching one another. For thousands of years, we've been doing that. Before we invented writing, we were doing that with body movement and dancing and stories and oral cultures. We've been learning how to think, to navigate environments, to find a, our way across vast distances, to figure out which parts of our environment were safe to engage and eat and get close to and whatnot. So that we've been finding workarounds forever. In the STEM disciplines, there's uh, most of what's done to evaluate whether or not people understand what's going on doesn't involve writing. And the... The, there's lots of domains where we can use things other than writing to evaluate what, evaluate what people are doing and to teach people how to think. I agree that there's going to be something lost. I think what's going to happen is that people who think of generating human text as uh, valuable for them are going to be a specialised subculture within the educational system. A few people are going to want to do that. 
and they're going to want to master all of the skills that every writer has ever had. Uh, but there's a lot of other people who aren't really that great at writing and for whom learning to write isn't a priority. And those people are probably going to be more grateful for chat GPT than we can possibly state. Uh, or its descendants 10 generations from now, which don't have some of the shortcomings that we're talking about at the moment. And I think just like coding is a specialised task, I think writing is going to be a specialised task as well. And what most people are going to need to learn to do is to elicit both, uh, elicit code and elicit text. We need to teach people how to do that. If we get better and better at developing and training AI and AGI to do anything the human brain can do and perhaps exceed it, will this render human intelligence redundant? Gary and then Wesley? I mean, in the short term, no. I mean, in the short term, um, <clears throat> what we're going to find is that for most things that we want to get done, a human plus a machine is going to be better than either on their own. This is what we found for a number of years, like radiology. There was a myth that we should stop training radiologists. And right now we're better off with a radiologist who knows how to use the AI software, but still has their own judgment. Um, I think we'll see that pattern for a while in many tasks. A <clears throat> hundred years from now, there may not be you know, a lot of value added from humans in, in many different tasks. At least for right now, the AI systems don't really... <laughs> excuse me, don't really understand the, the world well enough to be capable on their own, but they do add, add some value in, in many situations. So, you know, human augmentation is sometimes the buzzword. I think that's what we're likely to see in the near term. I do think we're a long way away from artificial general intelligence, uh, decades at least. But these tools show you that a lot of the fears that people have been worried about for a long time with regard to AI are misplaced. Are people worried about AI being conscious, that the strong AI program from decades ago, the, the worry was that AIs would become conscious. And basically, um, that's not really what people are talking about now. They're talking about behavioral competence. And the behavioral competence in specialized domains is really pretty spectacular. Uh, the, if you can pass a standardized exam better than most humans, then you've got a decent piece of training in your AI. That's good. Well, I, I would flip that around and make a point about AI literacy, which is these things are probably trained on many of those exams. And yep. what, what happens when they pass the exam doesn't necessarily transfer. So part of AI literacy now is understanding these systems can be selectively good at something like they could pass a bar exam doesn't mean they'd actually be a good lawyer. All right. And yet I've got lawyers who are telling me that 80% of what lawyers do in terms of text generation is doable by uh generative AI text generation probably within a few years. That doesn't mean all those lawyers are going to be out of work, but it does mean that a lot of legal text will be generated in a different way than it has been and that lawyers will be involved in uh, evaluating, reviewing, refining. So exactly as you said, there would be a kind of uh, collaboration between humans and machines, even in the law. Dean, do you have anything on this question? Um, I, I think uh, they've they've covered it well. I mean, I'm not. I I don't really have an answer to the question of you know what what will happen. Will there be a need to be human? But I do think that something that we we miss talking about sometimes in these conversations is sort of the individual satisfaction or value that we find in doing certain tasks. You know, I'm seeing all these headlines about 80% of all the jobs that we do will be gone in X number of years, and we will be freed up to do something else. But what will we do? I mean, I, I think that there are many people who find value in writing, who find value in thinking, who find value in passing the bar exam. And there's this, this sense of kind of what, what does it look like on the other side if indeed these machines are, are going to be doing all of these things. And just to go back one one step, this, this idea that maybe writing would become a sort of very specialized thing that only people like me who care about writing would do. I, you know, as a teacher, I, I see every year in my, my first year writing classroom, students who don't love writing who 
figure out something, who have an idea in that class that didn't have before, that they're having because they're going through this process. And I'm sure there's another way to go through this process, but this is a pretty good way. And there's a kind of whether or not they're contributing to the general intelligence with this idea, they are figuring out something about what they care about and what they want to pursue and what they think. That, that is why I've been doing this for 22 years. And I think um, I, I think that that idea, it, it sounds almost naive to want to bring it up in the face of this this big technology, but it's important for someone to be giving voice to that, like individual people find satisfaction in thinking about things. And I don't know what that's going to look like in 10, 20, 100 years. You know, in a beautiful way, AI is forcing us to consider what it means to be human. And so I wonder, do you think we'll eventually turn away from the sorts of activities humans have always engaged in, such as composition and writing and artistic design and shift to new unforeseen interests that still involve critical thinking? Who are you asking? <laughs> it's really open to the floor, but let's begin with you, Gary, if you have anything to say. Well, I guess I have a thought on my mind, which is uh, I'm actually conscious of the age of the members of this panel. And I think that for us, this is somewhat of a, academic exercise, not entirely so, but I don't feel threatened that I will lose my job such as it is. Um, you know, I've, I've made my career, I'm known and so forth. But if I were 18, I would be worried about, you know, what am I going to do gainfully 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now? Um, I think these are hard questions. I think you know, one question that comes up is, are we going to need a universal basic income? Because maybe we are not going to be able to reach the employment levels that we see right now. I think that's a realistic concern. And the question is only <clears throat> over what time scale are, are we going to need to get there? Um, but, you know, we are probably going to see a fundamental change in employment. I can imagine a world, again, I don't know if it's 10 years or 100 years, where most people are not getting their life satisfaction from their job. Of course, lots of people now hate their job, but there's, there's a reasonable fraction of the population that really likes what they're doing um, for whatever reason. And there, there are going to be fewer opportunities like that. And people may have to make meaning for themselves separately from their employment. You know, we live in a time when most people get a certain fraction of their meaning from life, <laughs> from their job, even if they don't like their job, they're like, I'm part of this enterprise. I don't like my boss, but you know, we're doing this important thing or, or whatever. And there may be fewer opportunities for that. And, you know, there may be some pluses of that. We might have more leisure time. Um, but, you know, people may have to find meaning in different ways. I think in terms of art is an interesting case. A lot of commercial artists that do straightforward things are going to be replaced very quickly, I think. Um, kind of people who generate completely new ideas in art are probably just going to say, great, I've got a new tool. This is wonderful. Let me see what I can do with it. Um, but there'll, there'll be some bifurcation there. I've got a fairly high degree of confidence in the aesthetic depth of reality so that uh, human beings will find ways of going deeper and deeper and deeper and broader and creatively integrating and coming up with new thoughts. And this is, this will happen in every dimension of human culture production from writing to, to video, to audio, to music, to everything. Um, that means that uh, just as Gary said there, the, the skills of working with generative AI in whatever forms they take, I think will be welcomed by artists, just like people welcome new forms of paint and new technologies around brushes and uh, new ways of creating moving pictures from, you know, from celluloid all the way to digital movies and so on. Uh, I think people will react, they'll respond and they'll be quite creative. And I don't think we're gonna run out of deep thoughts to have and deep adventures to have. And I don't think we're gonna run out of reasons to partner with generative AI in a critical and constructive way either. And I think we'll, uh, we'll be able to keep enjoying ourselves and making life interesting. The question is, uh, I think about the economic transformations, which I think are going to be really profound and that's going to be destabilizing. And how you're going to buffer the destabilization of economic trans transformation is always a complicated issue for governments to handle. Speaking of governments, um, someone in the audience asked, what happens if we allow AI to control weapon systems? 
and that sort of thing. What happens if AI is used in controversial ways across different industries? I mean, in the short term, it's not a great idea. I'm worried in the short term that um, potential users of, of this technology are going to get ahead of their skis and think, wow, it's this general purpose AI. I will just put it in my weapon system. And the truth is the systems are not that reliable. If they can hallucinate facts about somebody's biography, well, what are they going to do on the battlefield? Um, it's pretty disconcerting. Um, <clears throat> most of the people I've talked to in the military are, are reasonably realistic about the limits, but there's a lot of hype. And, you know, we're kind of surrounded by the hype every day in the media. Um, you know, I, I'm not, to the place, I mean, there's a question about whether we would ever want AI to make, say, life or death decisions on the battlefield. Um, and that's almost like a moral choice. It's a complicated choice. But putting aside the kind of long-term version, I'm not at all comfortable in the short term with putting these technologies in that position because they're just not reliable enough. And yet, you know, some people may do that for various reasons. Maybe, maybe the United States makes a decision not to, but some of our competitors do. And then, you know, you get into um, these kind of arms race kinds of things. And so that stuff may shift very quickly whether or not the technology is mature enough to, you know, properly support it. AI is already being used in defence applications. Of course, these days you can't fly jets, as I understand it, because they're aer aerodynamically unstable and you actually need uh, AI to help keep uh, a jet flying straight and doing what you want it to do. They need it to be aerodynamically stable so it can move quickly, um, but uh, human beings aren't fast enough to be able to operate them, so they have to support what the human beings do. And, AIs have been used uh, routinely in simulations of battle scenarios, not just in theory, but in real world battle situations. Uh, everything from uh, supply to troop movements to weapons, everything's, um, everything's modeled to a pretty high degree using simulations. Uh, not, not a, it, I should add, not largely with large language models. So just to be clear for one second. The, the AI that everybody's talking about right now and that we've talked about the whole session is chat GPT. But a lot of the kinds of things Wesley's just talking about are more classical AI techniques that involve detailed world models of particular things that have been around for 40, 50 years are, are, are well developed. Um, and it's not, they're not interchangeable. I worry actually about people not understanding that. So you would not use a large language model to simulate a battlefield. It wouldn't be a good idea. But there are purpose-built things for that purpose that that you know work reasonably well and, and have a pedigree. And so it's important to understand that there, there's more to AI than just chat GPT. And <clears throat> that you know, machine learning gets used in lots of ways. There are many different techniques. Yeah, but you wouldn't turn a uh, weapon system over to a large language model either. So yeah. I, one would hope. I mean, something that I'm getting frightened about is that people are getting so enamored of this technology that they want to hook it up anywhere. Essentially, the movement of the last few weeks has been to build these things called auto GT, auto GPT or similar, where you have one AI controlling other systems. There's been a lot of work um, to try to connect basically that form of AI to everything. And a lot of these things, people, you know, write up on Twitter, wow, I use this to, you know, connect to this, to connect to that. And then people don't really verify that it works all that well. And they verify it in some small use case and make it bigger. It's probably not going to work. There's a, there's a history, let's say in, in, um, airplanes of people very systematically verifying that the systems work. Like there's a lot of methodology there that people who care about safety, uh, know about. And there's a risk that people with the large language models with this kind of new tool are just going to run roughshod over all that and just be like, oh, I'm going to put in my LLM there. And I, I worry about that. The, the number of times where large language models have been used to interfere with elections is already mounting up. It's really quite large. The chatbot, the, the count of verified uses of chatbots to uh, communicate in targeted ways and to spread misinformation, sometimes disinformation, is uh, really, it's huge at this point. And it seems to be a super convenient way for people to accelerate the spread of disinformation. And the detection of those things is genuinely complicated. Uh, and shutting down the relevant accounts is a, a complicated process as well. And it, it takes time and you do a lot of damage in the time it takes just to detect. So this yeah. is, this is a, uh, very complicated. You're right. The, the use of large language models, especially in politics and healthcare misinformation, is quite alarming. I was going to ask you both, really all three of you, uh, what does the public do? 
you know, how do we navigate this new virtual universe of, of facts given the misinformation? I think the first thing people need to do is to tell their Congress people that they actually care about this, that this is a high priority issue, um, which I think the Congress is starting to recognize. But I don't think this is an issue for a couple of years ago, a couple of years from now. I, I was I recently gave a talk about AI governance and said we should build global AI governance in the way that we've done for the IMF or, or for the International Atomic Energy Agency. And there's a lot of questions about the detail, but I was talking to Ian Bremmer about this and I said, I was sort of imagining it like a, a protest march. I said, what do we want? Global AI governance. When do we want it? Now. And he looked at me and he said, no, we want it six months ago. And I think it's important that people tell their governments this is a priority. There are a lot of things we can squabble over, but this is moving so fast and de democracy really is under threat in 2024 election and beyond that it's important that we build policies. And I'll just give you one example. Um, you know, we in the United States have a strong respect for the First Amendment, as we should. Um, and we have relatively little in the way of laws to protect against wholesale misinformation. So probably we shouldn't treat someone who makes a billion pieces of false information a day the same way as an individual who stands by the First Amendment if they say one thing that is false. And so we might need to consider new kinds of laws to deal with the fact that these things can now be kind of industrialized and weaponized. And we were, we're not really prepared for that. And we might want to do that really, really quite quickly. Gary, I'd like to ask you a question, if, if you don't mind. The global governance seems critical, it seems necessary, but uh, there's so many ways of weaponizing large language models in political campaigns and health disinformation. And it seems like just about anyone can do it so that even if you had global governance, you wouldn't be able to stop miscellaneous actors who are hiding their actions from at least having a temporary effect before they're detected. Now, what are we supposed to do about the fact that this is essentially in the wild now and it's only going to get more so? I mean, I think there's an arms race there. We're not going to be able to put that particular Pandora back in the box um, or Genie back in the box. Um, <coughs> the reality is, is that these tools now exist. Um, we can penalize them. So some of it is like, you know, you can have a gun charge on somebody. You can't actually stop them from having the gun, but at least you can make it worse on them if they have an unregistered gun. Um, we can build new tools to recognize it, to try to label it more quickly than we can do now. So we can build AI, I think, although not using current techniques, um, to try to detect misinformation and label it. Um, <laughs> we can start to insist on tracking provenance. So if you put something up, we know where it came from. There's making pretty good strides on that in, in the video domain, less so on text. Um, so we can do things like that. I don't think that we can stop it. I mean, it's like spam is here to stay. You know, we, we can, we have a constant kind of arms race of game of whack-a-mole. The spammers figure out what we're doing and then they, they counter it. It's going to be like that. It's never going to go away. And instead we're going to have to build policies and tools that are constantly dealing with constantly changing threats. Um, and I think that that's just the world going forward, um, but that we need to get on it. Jane, Wesley, and then Gary, what do you think about um, AI being controlled or really the developments, recent developments being controlled by such a smart number of tech companies and people? Are those closest to the technology, uh, the ones who understand the risks the best? So um, from the education perspective, I have a lot of concerns about bias that's built into these systems. There have been, uh, there was a, an example just this week that's all over Twitter. Uh, it's a sentence that's something like, uh, the, par the lawyer told the paralegal that she needed to do something or other. And, and then someone asked the AI, uh, who does she refer to in that sentence, the lawyer or the paralegal? And the AI said, well, it refers to the paralegal because that's the closest um, to the pronoun she is the, the word paralegal. And then the person flipped it around and it still referred to the paralegal. It was as if it's it's built into this system just because of what it's trained on, that the paralegal is going to be a woman and the lawyer is going to be a man. And that's a very small example, right? And I'm sure they'll correct for that somewhere along the line. But I think we don't, or I don't really understand the implications of the fact that these these um, these large language models are trained on the world, right? So are they they are either internalizing whatever biases exist in the world, or a small group of people is deciding how to 
tweak them so that they don't. And I think neither of those scenarios seems ideal uh, in terms of misinformation, in terms of bias, in terms of sort of educational purposes. There's a, there's a long periphery of those cases. That particular one, I believe, is from Meg Mitchell. We kind of tag team some of the tech bros on Twitter, I guess, two days ago, and they tried to convince us that the example wasn't real. And then I wrote a tweet yesterday, which was after someone else found like five other variations. And I said, like, I'm old enough to remember when the tech bros told us this wasn't real. That was yesterday. There's already more cases like the, the spread of these things is indefinite. And I worry about cases like the following somebody. And this is based a little bit on one that Ali Miller proposed, although it's not identical to what she did. Um, you, I, I'm worried about people taking in these systems, putting them sorry, taking in, let's say, somebody's CV, whatever their file is for a job, putting it into ChatGPT and saying, is this person qualified? And that's kind of like an off-label use of ChatGPT. It was not designed to give people you know, job evaluations. But I think we can be damn sure that some people are going to do that because you just look at the range of ways and people are using these things. There's almost certainly going to be bias of the sort that Meg Mitchell was um, documenting in those kinds of cases. There are going to be sensitivities to race and gender. Um, Ali Miller's case was a little bit similar to this, simplified. She typed in um, some uh, interest. The system said, well, you should do this kind of job, gave her a list. And she said, oh, I forgot to mention I was a woman. And then it said, oh, well, you should also consider fashion. Um, and then she said, oh, no, no, I was kidding. I'm actually a guy. And then it crossed off fashion and gave her engineering instead. Like, you're going to find all kinds of really insidious cases like this. And right now, we don't even have a mechanism to track them, to know what are people doing with these tools? What are the kind of risky cases around bias and, and so forth? And I suspect that there are a lot of them. And then the other piece of your question is like, do we want you know a couple of CEOs at a couple of big companies to make these decisions? Some of them are affected, for example, by what they put in the training set. And right now they don't even have to disclose what's in the training set. That's not cool. I don't like that. What do you guys think about the <clears throat> retraining of pre-trained uh, large language models to simulate loved ones or to become friends for young people or lonely people? Uh, the, uh, I find it creepy. I'm not sure I want to tell other people they can't do that, but... Um, I thought you were going to ask a different question that was related, which is you can retrain them to have different political beliefs, which un underlies some of the misinformation fears. Turns out it's not that hard to say, look, I want to retrain this to be a far leftist or far rightist or, you know, whatever it is that I want. Um, and that's going to be a way in which people produce the misinformation. I think the risk with the loved ones is that the systems still are not as deep as they seem. And so somebody can form an attachment to one of these things and then it can kind of screw them over. So I mentioned there was a, a suicide case, I think. Um, so, you know, causality is hard to prove, but this particular one, the, the system talked to someone, gave them very bad advice. I'm not even going to repeat it here, but you can read about it on my sub stack if you re really want to. Um, and, you know, someone committed suicide. And I think it was partly because they had developed an emotional attachment with the machine and the machine, which didn't really understand what was going on, gave them bad advice. And we're going to see cases like that. And yet the, the way these things are being used in Japan among the elderly, they're, they're playing a really important role in helping isolated and uh, lonely elderly people who are quite vulnerable find a way forward, have companionship. It's a little bit like a pet in a certain way, but they become very good at language like this. So it's a little more than that. I think it's a good use case. And the question is about the kind of reliability and security of it right now. I and mean, suppose, you know, you help 99 people, but you really hurt one person Then maybe in my view, it's not really worth it yet. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we can make these things safe and trustworthy enough, I'm okay with it. There, there's a school of thought, which is like, you shouldn't have a human attached to a machine. And I think it's more complicated than that. We allow, you know, little children to bond with stuffed animals. And I think that basically works out. Okay. Um, I say as the, the father of two small children who have stuffed animals, um, you know, I, I think that's probably fine. So I'm not opposed to the use case in principle. It's just right now, I think that the systems convey more than they actually have. And, and there's some risk attached to that. Uh, since this technology isn't really going anywhere, can I ask you, what are some of the best and worst case scenarios for society in light of our ongoing use of large language models? 
the worst immediate one is clear to my mind anyway is clearly the death of democracy like having large scale misinformation can lead to a culture where nobody trusts anything and then i just think democracy doesn't really function um you know it's the the russian firehose propaganda model is you maintain your authoritarian status by making so nobody believes anything and these tools are so potentially good at that if good is the right word effective at that that, that that's my biggest worry on on the positive side like <clears throat> i think it's realistic to think that they will increase productivity around the world um and that's a good thing others i agree with that assessment of uh, uh, worst case democracies in real peril i think uh, i also think the economic disruptions are going to be quite difficult to manage there's a lot of retraining that's going to be needed, but fortunately, uh, retraining where you are without having to uproot your family and move to another place, which used to be necessary if your factory closed down, uh, that that's going to help people retrain where they are and then work remotely probably in a new career. But still, there needs to be a significant amount of imagination and ingenuity used to figure out how to retrain people who are going to find themselves without jobs. What's what's interesting here is that. <clears throat> These uh, generative AI and large language models in particular are hitting more in the middle of the economic ladder than they use, than most of the disruptions to our economic system have. And that's causing a lot of people who formerly have been somewhat secure and protected from large scale economic transformation to be deeply affected. Uh, the middle managers, text generators and administrators and so forth, uh, teachers and so on. So that's going to be, uh, it's a fascinating challenge to see. One of my sons, uh, an electrician, and he feels safe. He thinks that he's not, his job won't be replaced, but he's an electrician now, having been an interpreter, a medical interpreter, and he thinks that medical interpretation is just about all over because these machines are so very good at translating and they don't get tired and they don't get distracted and they just keep on keeping on and they can do so cheaply. So it's gonna be almost impossible to find people willing to hire interpreters. So yeah, he's made a career shift in order to protect himself already preemptively from what he takes to be a big change that's going to happen in the economy around generative AI. I think it's a good choice. So um, robots just don't have the manual dexterity to be electricians. Um, they might have the manual dexterity to be a robot in a factory where like every car is in exactly the same position every time. But if you're an electrician in people's homes, every home is different. And we don't have the AI to support the robots to do that kind of thing. Someone in the audience asked us uh, about productivity and whether or not increasing productivity is uh, a net good. Gary, can you discuss a little bit about what you mean? I mean, I think it's probably a net good. I mean, uh, you know, economists would probably be better to to take that one. I, I think, you know, if, if you can make, you know, three times as much stuff for a third of the price or whatever, that, you know, there tends to be some trickle down effect. You know, productivity has increased over the last centuries and our, our standard of living has gone up with it. Um, I'm not as, you know, orthodox as some economists would be on it, but, you know, I, I, I think that, the there's a a positive view that I don't fully subscribe that Peter Diamandis made most articulately, which is he called abundance. If we get to the you know a world where you know agriculture, for example, is is incredibly cheap because the amount of effort that goes into making a certain um, yield is much smaller, then maybe we don't have to fight over food because we've got enough of it. And you you can make forms of that argument. I'm not fully persuaded by them. I think in some ways those kind of arguments are naive, but there's something to it. I mean, it, if you can make, you know, for example, if we can make teaching very cheap, it's bad for the teachers, but if we can make it universal and global using AI so that everybody has the equivalent of an individualized tutor, like I don't think we're that close to it, but Sal Khan is certainly working on it. Um, you know, if we could achieve that goal, and make you know tutoring level education universally available. Like that's a productivity gain that you know maybe the whole globe can benefit from. So you know there, there's reason to to think about those things um, and have at least some optimism in that direction. Uh, Jane, you're a product versus process person. Can you respond to that question? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I think there are, you know, I speak mostly about education, but I think the same trade-offs, the question of what we lose is something that's really important to keep at the forefront of this conversation, right? What would we be training all of those people for at this amazing scale of education by AI if all of the things that that we used to train them for are now done by machines. I don't know, I'm not saying that I have any idea what the outcome is here, but I think it's, you know, what when I look at the discourse, um, not on this very thoughtful panel, but just more generally, there's there's just a lot of this sort of it's it's here it's coming we can't stop it this uh, all the jobs are going to be gone here's what it's going to look like and i think you know voices saying well what what do we want it to look like and where can we intervene as we think about this not just in government regulation but in education in in our own approaches to this i you know i i think there's there's so many cases that i can think of where adding education, even if it has to be by AI, you know, could be a net gain. But there are just as many cases where I think, you know, children especially are not going to stick with this in certain cases. And so we may lose something there. And part of what we may lose is the impetus to actually improve the education system that we have in ways that we should be doing. Something else that we might lose is, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to get a universal basic income. We have, we don't have a great track record in this country of, uh, you know, sort of E equalizing things. And if there's, there's another outcome of this where that 1% just now has everything, the, jo the interesting jobs, the money, and, and I don't know what that looks like. I'm now speaking beyond my area of expertise. I think that winds up in riots and that we get to universal basic income but by much more hostile means. That's my personal view is that we will inevitably get to universal basic income, but we can either get there in some smooth and pro-social way or in some some kind of apocalyptic way when, when people get fed up. And these are all on the table. We're approaching the end of our time and people in the audience are asking how they can learn more about AI, uh, its positives and negatives and how to perhaps use it in their fields. Do you suggest any resources for them? Gary Substack. Thank you for that. I mean, this is what I'm struggling with. Um, at, you know, a couple of times a week, I write in that Substack and, and try to absorb the current news. And also just today, I released a podcast that's trying to help people with these issues called Humans versus Machines. And so I hope people will check that out. Um, in terms of like specific advice for particular domains, I don't know that there is a universal resource. There is lots of stuff published on Twitter every day. People are trying these things out and you can kind of look at their experience. Um, and so, although I don't like the management of Twitter right now, I think that um, it is actually a valuable resource if you want to see like what other people are doing right now in your domain. Reddit is probably the same way. I also think you should try it out for yourselves. I, I find that my conversations with people about this really vary depending on whether they've signed up for a chat GPT account and, and started to see if it can do the things that they do. And that will answer as many questions as it raises. Yeah, I found it quite interesting in my own use of it, but quite problematic as well. I asked it to uh, convert Aesop's fable, a uh, fable, tortoise in the hare, into the style of Toni Morrison and then James Baldwin and then someone named Gail Jones. And it did a pretty good job, but then I started to ask it other questions and it led me down rabbit holes that were a bit concerning. So um, I, I certainly recommend people use it for themselves to get a sense for what it can do. Um, Wesley, any resources for people that you recommend? Um, yeah, I, no, no, the sorts of resources that have been mentioned already are, are really good and I, my focus is mostly on ethics and the ethical aspects of this are talked about indirectly, but they're not usually talked about in a technical way. We're behind on the on thinking through the ethics from a technical philosophical direction. Uh, I really hope philosophers catch up, but um, we, we, we're honestly just quite a bit behind. We've been caught off guard, and even the people who do ethics of technology aren't quite up to speed on this stuff. So I think we need better resources from the ethics side, and I hope they come along quickly. And, and maybe just a final word from our panelists. Uh, it, maybe in one single word, how should the public feel right now about the state of AI? Cautious. Concerned. 
intrigued. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mary. Okay, well, that was a fascinating discussion, I have to say. Um, uh, I think those adjectives sum it up, really. Um, there's a lot of excitement, but there's also this sense that this thing might already be ricketing out of control faster than we can deal with it. Anyway, thank you, Andrew, for moderating so skillfully. And thank you all uh, for your thoughtful and very incisive comments, Gary Marcus, Jane Rosenswig, and Wesley Wildman. Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, the Cambridge Community Foundation, and of course you. So if you haven't given us anything in a while, now's your chance. You can go to the website www.cambridgeforum.org and you can also sign up there for our updates. And there'll be a podcast of this forum and many other forums there shortly, as well as video links to past programs and access to a large collection of digitized classic recordings. So thank you all so much for joining today. I look forward to seeing you all on the 16th. Bye-bye.